You can turn, if you want, in your Bibles to John chapter 15. We'll look at the first five verses. We'll, we'll reference a, a few verses after that too, but we'll spend most of our time in those first five verses of John chapter 15. Uh, and this passage will change your life because Jesus talks about the most important thing in your life. You know, we believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Uh, and one of the things that that means is when we have his teachings recorded, we should probably pay attention to them. So let's do that. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. They say this. I am the vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. This is Jesus with fantastic insight into kind of the core issues of life. What he's dealing with here is, does my life matter? Am I bearing fruit in my life? It's kind of, are you going to get to the end of your life and see, yep, my life was devoted to the kingdom of God. I, I bore fruit for his kingdom. Or am I going to get to the end of my life and say, oh, it was wasted. So much of it was just lost and burned up. And in a single paragraph, Jesus gives us the key to knowing that our lives are going to matter, knowing that they're going to bear fruit for him. He says that our exterior life, our, our fruitfulness, the things that we do, the impact that we have, all comes from an inward life of abiding in Christ. Where does our life come from? It comes from the secret place with him. So there's so much to be said about this short section. We definitely don't have time to unpack it all, but I want to go right to the heart of the passage, the central instruction in the middle of it, where Jesus says, abide in me. Abide in me. I love that. Abide, it just means to stop. It means to pause. It means I'm not going to move on right away. I'm going to take time right here in the presence of God. Other translations just say, remain, remain in me. I'm just going to stay right here. It's kind of like Jesus is saying, take off your shoes and stay a while. Right. Stay in my presence. I don't know if you've ever had an experience like that. Maybe you're running an errand, dropping something off at someone's house, and you're not sure whether you're really supposed to go in and spend any time. So you kind of hang out at the doorway. And then at a certain point, they say, well, come on, come inside, take off your shoes, stay. And you're like, okay, I'm welcome right here. I can stay for a little while. And that's what Jesus is saying. Hey, you're welcome in my presence and I want you to stay. It also has kind of a, uh, th that word abide um, creates like a little word picture of, of camping or pitching your tent. That's kind of the idea is I found a good spot. I'm going to pitch my tent right here. Um, you know, when I was young, we went camping pretty much every summer. And what we did, there was a, a farmer who lived fairly close to us and he just opened up his field uh, in the summer for people to camp. So there was no kind of, places to camp. You just drove into the field and kind of drove around until you find a, a good spot. And then you pitch your tent right there. And when I first came to America, I camped a little bit with the, with the Bergendals. And I was like, ooh, this is fancy camping. You have your own little spot that's marked out where you put your tent. Uh, and it was only after that I realized that's just what normal people do. <laughs> we, we were the strange ones driving around this field. But what my dad would do is he'd drive around, you know, kind of look for a good spot, and then he'd find one and say, okay, this is a good spot. I'm going to plant right here. Let's set up the tent here. And that's ju just basically what Jesus is saying. My presence, that's a good spot. Plant yourself down right here. That kind of tent imagery too is um, it's an allusion to the Old Testament, to the people of God uh, throughout their history. Because what happened was uh, in the book of Exodus, when God rescued the nation out of Egypt, he established them as a nation. But then the very next thing he did before giving them a land to live in, he started to give Moses very detailed instructions about a tabernacle. Right. It's like the nation is free. What's the first priority? 
you need to build a tent. You need to build a tent. And why is that? Uh, he said, uh, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. As God's saying, the most important thing about this nation is that they would have my presence amongst them. I'll abide with them. Now they can abide with me. And the way the book of Exodus works is you read for chapters and chapters and chapters about uh, the way this tabernacle is meant to be constructed and it had different things inside of it. It had a, a table with a lampstand and a loaf of bread. They put a loaf of bread out there every day that no one ate. Um, and they had a chair or a throne. It's called the mercy seat. And all of these things are just imagery of a house. The basic idea is let's furnish a house so that God can take off his shoes and stay a while. We want God to, this to be his house, his dwelling place. He can abide here with us. And so we read this for chapters and chapters, and then there's a, a break in the story where, as we know, the, the Israelites fell into sin. They created a golden calf and they worshipped him, and then, uh, or worshipped it. And then God said to Moses, I'm not going to go with this people. I, you can still go into the promised land, but I'm not going to go with you because I might destroy you along the way. And our reaction as, as readers is, is supposed to be, no, that's terrible. We've just spent all this time reading about your house. And now you're saying you're not going to live in it. You're not going to go with us. And that was Moses. We're not even going to leave if you don't go with us. Because I get that the most important thing in my life, the most important thing about this nation that I'm trying to lead is the presence of God. And so he said, this is Exodus 33, verse 15. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. If I don't have your presence, I'm not going. And of course, God, full of mercy and grace, relents and says, yes, I will. I'll continue to abide with my people. We have such a gracious God. And so this is an incredible theological truth, is that God makes himself known to his people. He presences himself uh, with the people that he calls his own. And for me, you know, in my story, this was when I got my head around this, this was really the thing that caused me to um, give my whole life to seeking God. It was, a, it was a revelation of the, the cross uh, in the beginning that I, I gave my life to God uh, when I was convicted about my own sin and realized that Jesus had made a payment for that at the cost of his own life. I kind of said, how could I not give my life to God? Right. But when I realized that the God of the universe, almighty God, was offering his presence to me, was offering relationship, I was like, well, now that's what my life is all about. <laughs> like, if that's actually true, then my whole life is for pursuing God now. I want to know his presence. And that's what this truth is supposed to do. The fact that we can know God doesn't make us just rest back into, well, yeah, I invited Jesus into my heart 20 years ago. Do you ever feel him? Do you ever speak to him? No, but I know he's in there. Uh, that's not the reaction that we're supposed to have. It's, wow, if Jesus is making himself known to me, I'm going to press on into his presence. If he's telling me to abide with him, I'm going to make that a reality in my life. This is why Jesus gave it as an instruction. He said, abide in me. He didn't say, uh, you do abide in me. He said, abide in me, do it. Do it, come close into my presence. And that's a contrast to what he just said a verse earlier. He said, already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. So that's something that's already done by him. My word, I've spoken it to you. You're clean. You're forgiven. Nothing you can do to add to that. That's one to rest back into, if I could say it like that. But knowing my presence, abiding with me, that's something you do. God's putting the ball in our court and saying, come into my presence, abide with me. This is true again in the Old Testament. You know, they had the, the temple of the Lord with them. And, and just to say, that's an incredible thing. The fact that they had the temple and they had the presence of God made them the most privileged nation on earth. No doubt about it. Uh, but we have something even better than that because one of the things the Bible talks about that Jesus accomplished on the cross. It says that his blood was applied to our bodies. Uh, and the reason for that is to make our bodies clean so that God could come and dwell inside of us. I mean, it's just mind-blowing, breathtaking. But God said, I'm going to um, 
send my son to the cross so that his blood accomplishes something in you, making you a place for me to live. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. But again, it's something that we, we press on to take hold of. Yeah. And so all of this to say is we can know God. You can know God. You can know his presence. You can know his voice. You can know relationship with him. And if that's true, then why don't we all the time? Yes. Name of my message is devoted or distracted. What's, what's holding us back from the presence of God? You know, there can be many reasons. Um, one of the reasons is just simply that we don't know how. Maybe we carve out time to spend with God and, wait, what do I do now? Uh, and I'm so thankful for people in my life who have known God better than me and have taught me how to spend time with God. I'm so thankful for that. I'm thankful that the disciples asked Jesus how to pray. It's kind of relieving for me because I'm like, okay, they don't know either. <laughs> Let's figure this out together. And so there can be all kinds of reasons, but I believe that one of the main reasons for many of us that we don't prioritize abiding with God like we should is because of distraction. Yeah. It's like we know that God is incomparably great, but here's a little shiny thing over here, yeah. taking my attention. This is definitely something that God's been speaking to me about in my life. I'll share a little bit more about that a little bit later. But uh, one thing that really um, convicted me and um, stayed with me was, um, you guys might remember a number of months ago at the beginning of the year when Scott opened our series on the uh, book of First Peter. And he ended with quite a long quote, which was all about uh, how to render the church ineffective. And what he said was, if you want the church in the West to be ineffective, to have no impact, then don't persecute them. The worst thing you could possibly do is persecute them because that could wake them up to the realities of who they are in God, divine appointment. We want to be awake to that. And so this is what this quote says, don't persecute them, instead entertain them, pamper them, fluff their pillows, give them everything that their hearts desire, and make them satisfied with that. Take their eye off the thing that matters the most. What, I've, what I found is that church leaders all over the country are raising a warning about this. Let me read you one quote from Ronald Rollheiser. He said this, we for every kind of reason, good and bad, are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. It's not that we have anything against God, depth and the spirit, we would like these. It's just that we're too habitually preoccupied to have any of them show up on our radar screens. Is that convicting? It's like we don't neglect God because we hate God. It's just because we're distracted by other things. He said, we are more busy than bad, more distracted than non-spiritual, and more interested in the movie theater, the sports stadium, and the shopping mall and the fantasy life that they produce in us than we are in church. Pathological busyness, distraction, and restlessness are major blocks today within our spiritual lives. I think this quote is very insightful and convicting. Uh, this idea that so many of the things that we're giving ourselves to are creating this fantasy life that we're trying to chase after, not realizing that we have the best thing already. Jesus provided everything we need to get into his presence and know God Almighty. Timothy Keller, the late great preacher, um, said it more succinctly. He was asked one time, why is it that young adults find it so difficult to know God as a personal reality in their lives? Like we all find it hard to abide, but why does it seem to be particularly difficult for young people? And he said, busyness and distraction. It's more easy to tweet than it is to pray. And so against this backdrop, uh, the words of Jesus are piercingly relevant. Uh, I want to read one more passage that Jesus said about prayer. In Matthew chapter 6, he said, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. 
Okay, so this isn't Jesus coming against uh, organized or public religion. He's saying there's a danger of hypocrisy there. But what he's saying is the money is in the secret place. You want to really know God. You want to grow in intimacy and depth with him. That comes from shutting the door and getting alone with God. Now I'm told that um, houses at this time where Jesus was preaching were typically a square and had four rooms and one little tiny room in the middle uh, which is where they kept their food, because that was the uh, coldest part of the house. Uh, and that was typically the only room with a door. So when Jesus says, shut the door, what his hearers would have been imagining is squeezing into this tiny little food closet in the middle of their house. It's kind of a humorous image. At least it's meant to be a really memorable word picture for us to have. And Jesus isn't saying that's the room where you need to pray. What he's saying is there are distractions against your inward life with God. And what you need to do is shut out those distractions. How do you grow in the grace of God? How do you grow in intimacy with him? Recognize what the distractions are in your life and shut them out. That's what Jesus is saying. Now, there's no evidence that Jesus actually prayed in that kind of closet. Seems like he had a preference for um, the wilderness, getting out in nature and spending time with God. And when we read through the Gospels, we see that that was his practice, that over and over again, it's like he had a busy day of ministry. Jesus got up early in the morning, spent time with the Father. Jesus sent the disciples away on a boat and, and stayed late at night, just communing with the Father. But we see that he, like no other, practiced abiding with God. He practiced the secret place. I'd like to share for a moment, again, just more personally from my own life. This is something that uh, God's been speaking to me about a lot over the last few months. I uh, kind of referenced it a couple of weeks ago. Um, but God's really been dealing with me uh, on this issue of distraction. What's been distracting me from the secret place? Uh, and, and for me, the thing that God really pinpointed was my iPhone and my iPhone use. Uh, so this teaching certainly isn't about iPhones, but it is about distraction. And I think a lot of us are in the same boat together, aren't we? Yeah. So um, God was doing a lot in my life. And in the end, I felt like this is so amazing what he's kind of freeing me from in terms of distraction and bringing me into in terms of a renewed intimacy with God that I did something that I almost never do, which was post about it on Facebook. I was ashamed of myself, but no, I'm kidding. Um, but I wanted to read out my Facebook post to you guys because I thought it was probably just the quickest way to kind of succinctly communicate a little bit about what God has been doing in me. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, so I said, hi, friends. For a number of years, I felt a level of conviction about my iPhone use and a sense that my habits with my iPhone, while not overtly sinful, do not honor God or speak of Christian discipleship. I've tried to make adjustments with varying levels of conviction and success over that time. After a short conversation with Gary Bigger in April, I decided it was time to dial up my efforts in this area. And by the way, if you want change in your life, I recommend a short conversation with Gary Bigger. They're <laughs> always great. I became convinced that this is the most pressing issue in my discipleship to Jesus. Uh, was the way that I was stewarding my iPhone use. And again, pr most pressing issue, not most central issue, but the one that God was pressing on my heart and my conscience uh, for the last number of months. I began to wage war against distraction, gradually deleting more and more apps, setting my phone to grayscale, which turned out to be a, a game changer. Turned out that what I was getting distracted by was lots of pretty colors. It's like you see that... Facebook icon is so clear and crisp, that cool blue with the, just that brilliant white F right in the middle of it. And it's like, I can't not touch it. <laughs> well, how about that YouTube logo, the brilliant red? And you just think there must be an amazing repository of information inside of this app, because how else could they come up with such a brilliant red? Uh, I'll touch it again. So uh, ashamed to say, I was just distracted by pretty colors. Uh, so I changed my phone to grayscale, still on there. Um, anyway, it did that, taking email off my phone, whose terrible idea was that anyway, and turning off my phone in the evening as much as possible and over the weekend. 
I wanted to post this photo that I posted because my iPhone use has gradually decreased. And last week was the first week that I averaged under an hour per day, uh, which, by the way, is not any kind of uh, not any kind of legalistic standard for anyone, or including myself. But it's just as I was, I was kind of gamifying the whole process, seeing how well I could do, uh, and so that was a, a good moment for me. Anyway, why I'm writing this post is to tell you my life has gotten so much better. I have two or more extra hours per day, every day. I have less anxiety, way less distraction, way more productivity, way more fun and enjoyment of life. But by far the best, my intimacy with God has skyrocketed. I'm spending more time with him than ever and finding that my mind is able to be still in his presence and connect with him in a totally different way. Because it, it's more than just it taking my time. It's taking my attention. I found that it was actually robbing me of the ability to be still before God. I still have so far to go in this regard, but I'm more envisioned than ever for knowing God personally and deeply. Getting on top of iPhone habits is hard work, but in the end, it's no real sacrifice. You trade out hollow pleasures, mindless distraction, and constant background stress for life, presence, joy, and intimacy with God and those around you. Maybe this is not an issue for you, but I'd encourage any serious follower of Jesus to reflect on their use of technology and consumption of entertainment and make repentance and change in this area an object of serious prayer and effort. The goal is not less iPhone use. The goal is freedom from unhelpful habits, which opens you up into a life of service, intimacy, and love. You will not regret it. And again, the reason why I posted that, really the reason why I'm talking about it this morning is because I came to be convinced that the enemy uh, had robbed me of the most important thing. And I'd been foolish enough to fall into a trap and not even realize that there was a problem going on while all the while God was waiting to be met with. I can know God intimately. And so I kind of switched, really the switch for me was away from, uh, okay, I need to have these things balanced in my life, which I thought for a long time, to I'm just going to wage war against them. If they're distracting me from the presence of God, then I just don't want them. Uh, and it made such an impact in my life that I just, I wanted to share it. And this is the tactic of the enemy in our lives because, uh, listen, he knows better than we do what a difference it makes to have this vital connection with God. There's nothing he fears more than a room of people spending time alone with God and then launching out into their day from that place. I think he's pretty terrified with it. Uh, so he came up with a great tactic, which was just to distract us from it with fun things. He knows how important it is. So let's look at three reasons why Jesus said it was important from, again, our original passage back in John chapter 15. Verse one, Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. This is the setup of our lives is that Jesus is our total source of life. If you think about a branch, the only way it can be alive is by being connected into the vine. In fact, the most important thing about that branch is right at that point where it connects into the vine. The bigger that space is, the healthier that space is, the better the branch is gonna be is the single most important factor for the health and fruitfulness of a branch is what's going on in that connection point to the vine. Well, Jesus is saying, I am the vine. I am the vine. So the most important thing for you is your connection point to me. It's an image here of total dependence on God. The branch can do nothing without that connection. This is how our spiritual lives work. Henry Nouwen said it like this, without solitude, it is virtually impossible to live a spiritual life. Without solitude, it is virtually impossible to live a spiritual life. We do not take the spiritual life seriously if we do not set aside some time to be with God and listen to him. Now, Jesus is talking about more than just having a quiet time in the morning. Abiding is about knowing God throughout our day, whether we're working or parenting or shopping or whatever our activity is, we can know the presence of God with us. So it's about a whole life for us. 
but it's certainly not about less than spending time alone with God. And again, we see this is the pattern of Jesus's life. How did he know the presence of God with him all the time? How did he have so much fruit in his life and ministry? It's because this is the thing that he prioritized above all. I need connection back into God. Second thing here is that from the secret place, we start to bear fruit. Jesus, again, in verse four said, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, neither can you unless you abide in me. So we all want our lives to be fruitful for Christ. And what Jesus is saying here is it's not from more and more and more activity. It comes from knowing me in the secret place and then your life just will bear fruit. You won't be able to help it. You'll just have a fruitful life. Again, if you imagine a branch broken off from a tree lying on the floor, all potential for fruitfulness has gone from that branch. There is nothing left for it. It has no ability to produce fruit by itself. It is now dead, right? Fruit only comes from it being connected into God. Now, praise God that he can graft branches back in. That's good news, isn't it? But this is the picture that Jesus is creating for us. A few verses after this, Jesus starts to speak about incredible fruitfulness in our prayer life. He says, if you abide in me, that if is a big word, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Who wants that kind of prayer life? Ask whatever you wish. It'll be done for you. That sounds pretty amazing. Now, how does that happen? It's all about the if. It comes from spending time abiding with Christ. A little bit later, Jesus talks about incredible fruitfulness in relationships. He says, you want to abide in my love. And as you do this, you'll become a, a loving person. That In all your relationships, uh, you're just going to, uh, love is going to flow out from you. Now, that sounds amazing, doesn't it? What one of the things the Bible talks about is that love is an action. It's something that we do. It's like, you might not feel love, but you can still act love. And that's important. But what Jesus seems to be offering here is an actual transformation where you do feel love, where that, is, that becomes who you are. So it's your instinct response to show love. How can that happen? How can we become that kind of people? By abiding with Christ. Third thing here is that in the secret place, we become sober. Many times we choose to distract ourselves because there's things that we don't want to deal with. Maybe there's a sin issue. Maybe there's a um, painful relationship. Maybe we just don't want to face up to the calling that we have in Christ through the gospel. And there's a sober side to this teaching. Jesus says in verse six, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. The branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. Uh, what Jesus is saying here, uh, this is just the consequence for not abiding is absolute uselessness. Like once that branch is down, especially a vine branch, by the way. If you're talking about an oak tree, maybe I could form that branch into a piece of furniture or something. But a vine branch, there's nothing left for this thing. Uh, it is doomed to a life of uselessness, if I can say it like that. Now, again, God can graft us back in, but this is the warning Jesus is saying. This is a serious thing. I want you to take really seriously. Uh, this is a matter of life and death. What's the most important thing about your life? spending time with God in the intimate place. Now, this is, uh, again, what happened to me. Um, you know, a couple of months into really making these changes in my life and, and seeing God just uh, honor that and, and, and start to produce some, some fruit in me. Um, I just found myself praying one morning and I was just full of thankfulness. God, I feel like you saved me. I feel like you saved me. I was just like, caught in meaningless distractions, shallowness. I wasn't being the kind of parent or husband that you've called me to be. All of these kinds of things. Um, and wasted time. I feel like you've just saved me from so much wasted time. And right when I said that, wasted time, 
It's like it just turned from thankfulness to repentance. All of a sudden, I just felt the conviction of, I've wasted so much time, so many hours, and I don't think that honors you, God, at all. So I'm just repenting before God. And I felt like God said, I forgive you, which was amazing. But what happened to me was a soberness came to me. I spent years thinking, yeah, I could do a little better with these kinds of issues. A couple months in, I'm like, no, this is life and death. I'm seeing things uh, with a perspective that I was sorely lacking. Paul, you want to come up? My, my prayer and my desire is that if you've been distracted from the secret place with God, if you recognize any level of that in your own life, uh, that this morning will be a morning where you could catch a vision for these things and start to prioritize again. Like, okay, when Jesus said, shut the door, what does that mean for me? How do I respond to that in my life? And my heart is that we catch a vision for this and start to make some changes because I just know that the offer from God is life and fullness in his presence, the life of abiding that we live from. One more quote for you here. This is from another church leader, Andrew Sullivan. He said, Modernity slowly weakened spirituality by design and accident in favor of commerce. It downplayed silence and mere being in favor of noise and constant action. The reason we live in a culture increasingly without faith is not because science has somehow disproved God, but because the white noise of secularism has removed the very stillness in which it might endure and be reborn. And so again, what he's saying here is modern life with all of its speed and pace and technology and distractions, none of it has made an effective argument against God. You couldn't look at any single thing and say, this has disproved God. Instead, what it's done is just given us so much noise, so much distraction that it's squashed our faith down. And what God wants to do, and what I believe he wants to do this morning is to give us a space a secret space alone with God where our faith might endure and be reborn. I believe God wants our faith, our hope, our love to just spring up again. Well, it happens in the secret place with him. So I just want, uh, Paul's going to play for a few minutes here and I would just love us to take a moment, all of us individually before God. Is this something God's speaking to you? Is there something that God's putting his finger on by way of distraction? Maybe this message is an encouragement to you to keep pressing on. Fantastic. May it be. But maybe there's a distraction. For me, it was social media, the news, way too many political podcasts, entertainment, random YouTube videos. It wasn't my kids. It wasn't my job. So just let God speak to you, reveal those things. And as they come up, just know that you're in the presence of a gracious, gracious, merciful God. The only reason he would bring conviction to your life is to help you to transform. So let's take a few minutes in his presence here.
our church called Katie McCray recently wrote a song which is all about this. It's about knowing God, the incredible privilege of knowing Jesus Christ for ourselves. And so I want to sing this back to God together as a, a response, a way of saying, yes, God, this is our heart, is to pursue after your presence in a fresh way, in a new way together. Could I 
God, we thank you so much for your amazing, gracious invitation right into your presence. God, we say your presence is where we want to be. That's where we want to be, God. And so we hear you. Help us to respond. God, give us grace to be great responders to you. And meet with us, God. We just say our heart is to know you better. We want to abide with you. We want to know you in the secret place. God, we determine to press on together. God, to go to our room, to shut the door and to press into your presence, God. We love you. We thank you, God. Amen. Amen.